Hello, everybody. I believe we are live and welcome to LitFest Pasadena, the virtual version. I'm here with Lisa Callow. We're actually together, human beings beside each other. Fascinating. And Bill, we wish you were here with us, but I'm so glad that you are. I was here. invited. <laughs> <laughs> Come on over, you're only five minutes away. Right. <laughs> anyway, my name is Al You may know me. I was with KCT Public Television, a reporter, an anchor, and so forth for like 30 years there. I retired about three years ago. I live in Altadena, only a few minutes away from Lisa, and I'm having a great, great time as a retiree. I recommend it to anybody who can afford it. Just go for it. It's the best part of life. All right, we're going to look. Uh, we're going to look at food through the uh, perspectives of two fantastic people. Uh, they're both they're food lovers. They're writers. They're interesting folks. But let me tell you a little bit first about Bill. Bill Sparsa is the winner of the James Beard Award for his coverage of the LA taco scene in LA Magazine. He's one of the country's leading experts on Mexican food. He's a California native, and for the past five years, he's been host and curator of LA. Taco Landia Festival. You can update this graph. My little off because of COVID. Tacoando, tacoando. <laughs> Taco Landia. Oh, Taco Landia. Taco Landia. Did I say it right? Tacoando. Uh, that, that, that's the old festival. Oh, it's the old festival. Got it. He also appears regularly on CNN, KCOW's radio show, Good Food, and TV shows such as I'll Have What Phil's Having, Bizarre Foods, and Top Chef. He has traveled extensively through Latin America. He's tasted his way through every one of Mexico's 31 states. And of course, he's an expert on Mexican food here in Southern California, which he calls Alta Mexico. <laughs> At the same time, Bill is a provocateur. He's, a, he's critical of certain food writers who have hijacked the 100 year struggle for Mexican American restaurant tours to gain mainstream acceptance. He can elaborate on that a little bit more and tell us about his cookbook in just a moment. And also with us is Elisa Kahlo, well known as the founding executive director of the Armory Center for the Arts in Pasadena, a nationally recognized center for arts, education, and community. She's also a consultant to the nonprofit sector. She has now crafted a new identity, still a founder, however, and her love is community. The result, the cookbook, The Urban Forger. Well, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be shown in a minute through our slides, but I'm happy with it. Here we go. Okay. The Urban Forger, culinary exploring in L and cooking in LA's east side, which means Altadena in part, along with a whole large, larger yeah, more area. Than Altadena, more, more than Altadena. More than Altadena, please. Wink. <laughs> Elisa spent her formative years in Southeast Asia, where she meandered through the culinary marketplaces filled with enticing and unfamiliar foods. She's completed the pro cooking course at the New School of Cooking and is an enthusiastic member of LA Bread Bakers. And you may also know her through her adventurous blog, The Urban Forager. So welcome, both of you. We only have, what, 50 minutes, and they are tied on time, so we're going to get right yeah, into yeah. it. 45. Oh my goodness. Bob, tell us real quickly, what about your background led you to get so deeply interested in food? Should we hold our first book slide up yeah. just for fun? Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there Toby. you are. Yeah, Toby's going to do it. There's so. the slide. There it is. There, there it is. Look at, look at that. Oh, never mind. I think, I think we're not <laughs> okay. having this, perhaps. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm, uh, being a Mexican-American Mexican kid, uh, obviously, for me, Mexico was in my grandmother's house. And I was inspired by her and my conversations with her about food. Also, my dad, who was very much into cooking and, you know, talking about all of our uh, family's recipes. And also, and really, probably the most profound thing that happened was my grandparents took me to Mexico in 1976, 77, on a road trip, driving from Northern California, three days straight. And, and that changed my life because I got to see... I mean, I got to see Mexico in the 70s and, you know, eating at my aunt's uh, in my in the homes of all the relatives, really having that experience really, really affected me, especially uh, um, a bag of carnitas I had along the way. So that is <laughs> why I'm here. <laughs> Elisa, how did you get into the whole food world? Because your, your background is nonprofit management and organization. Well, I think I think you said it well. I, I, I realized that there is a term called our common table, and that can be a metaphor for a lot of things, but food is a lot more accessible than the visual arts, even though that's my background. It is what everybody does. Everyone eats and many people cook. Mm -hmm. But my original background that led me is similar to Bill's in that my parents were Peace Corps people. At the age of 11, all the way through 16, we were living overseas in the Philippines and then Malaysia and in those countries. 
we really had a lot of open markets that in this country we hadn't yet. We didn't have farmers markets in the 60s and 70s. And as a young person, um, I think I was very visually attuned. I, I was, an, I, I think it was an early esthete. So when we would go out to markets, I was literally falling apart with excitement because of the over, overload of visual material, sensory material of taste, color, sound. And it made me want to find out too what all these things were that I hadn't seen before. And I was very brave about saying, can you tell me what this is? Can you tell me how you use it? I think just to be brief, one, one experience I remember very, very well was in the Philippines when we went to the Fiesta days and our, our little um, village and we were invited to every single household there as Peace Corps people. So I heard I was 11 and we went to every single household. So nobody would feel bad that the one American family didn't show up. And at every house, we ate a variation on lechon, which is a beautiful barbecued pig that goes on for hours. Bill knows what it is. At one house, I was offered the pig's tail and the ears. And at first I kind of looked a little uncomfortable. My father leaned over and said, you're going to eat that. Because as a Peace Corps person, rejecting food is a big no-no and I found out they were the the, t the tail was a little difficult but the ears were fabulous and I remember thinking this is like this is like uh, chicken skin on steroids man I love this and from then on I became a very adventurous eater and I also realized there was so much care put into that food there was so much skill that really great food doesn't necessarily come from restaurants it comes from people who have generational knowledge, and that that stuck with me forever. And that's actually so, part of your cookbook, which we'll get is, into it a bit. And I, Bill and I are totally in agreement yes. there. So, Bill, could you describe a couple or pick out one of the favorite recipes from your book? And I think we have some slides to accompany as well. I'm I'm hoping we yes. haven't we haven't seen the slides yet, but yeah. Well, I mean, I can talk about. I, I think I can talk about something that's more recent, and and also, you know. On the slides, I can, I can, I can do the slides. I can do both. Um, so we can go down to the third slide, Toby. That's Lisa. There we go. Oh, yeah. That? Well, well, you know, when I saw when I saw this pop up before we joined today, uh, it reminded me that Chef Jimmy Shaw, Jimmy Shaw just reopened his uh, loteria. You know, he had uh, lost the farmers market loteria grill, and he had uh, closed in on down the street from me here in Hollywood and really the whole thing just imploded, you know, and this was before the pandemic and then the pandemic came and he had a, a catering hall that, uh, or, or catering office, but now he's opened a, a taqueria window. So he's back. And, and that's one of the things that's happened really since writing the book, I just looked at the uh, copyright today that it was 2017 and a lot mm -hmm. of restaurants have closed. Um, chefs have transitioned to other projects, um, and and so to me, like 2017, it becomes really an important year in um, Los Angeles Mexican cuisine. But what I, what I really love about this re recipe, besides the fact that Jimmy's back, and I, I'm really happy that he's back in business and he's excited about it, is you know I think for a lot of people in Los Angeles, having breakfast at uh, the Loteria stall. And the in the uh, farmers market, the original farmers market was really a part of a Los Angeles experience that had been around since you know, well, gosh, um, for a while, right? And and I think that's one of the many many things P you you would people wanted to go to the farmers market to see it, but there were certain places that really defined that market. And this dish, the the huevos divorciados, you know, something that's really uh, very common in any any every city in Mexico has huevos divorciados. This these uh, two using the the salsa technique, making a pair of salsas to put on uh, fried eggs, and having them with with refried beans. Um, Jimmy Shaw being from Mexico City, they're black, and and then the the potatoes gives it that really you know that home feeling, like you're like you're at your grandma's house. But yeah, to me, this scene. The farmers market is is uh, I think will never leave me, and uh, and it's great that people can do this at home. Okay, and let's see if we can go to the next slide. One of these. Right. Ooh, 
So very simple. Do you want me to talk about my, yeah. this, well, this is, this is one of the simplest dishes in the cookbook and a big part of the urban forager cookbook was it was not only a cookbook that celebrated five plus one chef. And I'll explain that in a minute in Los Angeles and the East side, but it also was a kind of teaching book. I wanted to give people courage to cook. And so a huge section of the book, one of the earlier sections is on sort of pantry superchargers and ways that you can develop foods that you use over and over again in a million ways. And this is truly, it's and not Val's favorite, it's not Val's favorite recipe, which he will probably explain in a minute, but it is one of the easiest recipes in the book. It's creme fraiche. And creme fraiche, um, as the late, great Joseph Schuldheiner said, is every time I walk by my refrigerator, I take a spoon of creme fraiche. <laughs> it really greatly brightened up my day, but it's a form of sour cream. It's much smoother and liquidier, and it's so much cheaper to make it yourself. And it's great on eggs, I'm sure. that It's, it's very much like a crema, a Mexican crema. You can um, use it in any way you'd use sour cream. I... I mix it in, in scrambled eggs. I put it on top of uh, avocado. I mm -hmm. sometimes put it on beans. I, I, I mean, this is just one of my, it's like my ketchup. Or, really you know, the old version of ketchup. And basically all you do is you take cream that isn't ultra pasteurized, mix it with buttermilk, stir it, and wait about two or three days, depending on the heat in the room when you've got creme fresh. Wow. And so one of the things I try to do is demystify a lot of basic recipes that most traditional style home cooks from various cultures, they all know how to do this stuff. They all say, start with a great pantry. And this is one of those dishes along with Jack Agoyan's yogurt, who's one of the chefs, um, clarified butter, certain kinds of pickles. This is, this is the, one of the easiest wow, recipes. Very pretty. What's next here? We'll let our slides do the talking. Okay, what's, what's this? Ooh. Ceviche, ceviche what? de camarón. So mm. yeah, I think, this for the same thing that um, Elisa really, you know, emphasizes is that techniques are so important. They're more important than you know a bunch, you know, a bunch of recipes. Some some of these books out there, um, you know, there's so many recipes, and and uh, that you don't even know like where to start, and and they don't don't really, they don't have any connection. And what the connection I think for me with this book was like these are things once you learn how to do the ceviche from Kani seafood. And uh, you can do any kind of ceviche. You know, you've got the an understanding of a certain type of ceviche from Nayarit that, that her uh, father uh, brought to the United States, brought to Los Angeles. And of course, everybody does ceviche with lime, you know, as, as a base before they add other types of things. But this simple, you know, taking tomatoes, purple onions, cucumber, you know, um, and, and the cilantro and, and lime juice, and really using good product and understanding, you know, the, the, the little, little subtle things that you need to do preparing the lime for this and, and pick choosing a good lime uh, to me, like you can now, and ceviche should be part of every summer, you know, barbecue, you should have something, that's the way you should start. That's Mexican style, you know, have a little ceviche before you have your carne asada. Yeah. So yeah. And you can ceviche anything, veg vegetarian, seafood, uh, raw meat, whatever you want to do. Now, you know what, Bill? The most, a lot of the ceviche I see is soupier. Like this looks a lot as if you've drained all the, you know what I mean? Sometimes you buy it at the store and it's got, a, it's in a lot of juice. It's in a lot of liquid. And well, this is so much more appealing. Yeah. What What are you doing buying ceviche in the store? Why aren't I? One thing I'll notice about this in terms of technique, because we'll just forget she didn't say that. Yeah, we'll, we'll forget about the supermarket ceviche. <laughs> One of the things I notice is all of the pieces are chopped the same size, which is a oh. typical traditional way of, oh, of so honoring your food, is that so you take time and notice this. So, you know, people will often say, you know, like the, the whole, you know, perfection in food, but this comes through a person's body. They literally watch somebody do this and they, they, they just do it. They don't. When I was working with people on the recipes, we had to reverse engineer so that, because they just knew it so well that they forgot yeah. to say something. Oh. And I went, oh my God, they're all the same size. And they went, oh yeah, I didn't realize that. You know, So that's something I noticed. And then chilies are in there too, right, Bill? I'm assuming. Uh, well, well, it's in the, in the um, lime juice. Oh, it's so in the lime juice, okay. 
so it's blended inside. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's uh, chili jalapeno. But, you know, the, the, the mise en place for her setup is there's pureed, there's a salsa that they use. You, you get that salsa when you come to the restaurant and you sit down at the table, they put it out for you with, with chips. But that same salsa is the one that is used for the, uh, the uh, ceviche and also for aguachiles. And you just put um, a, a certain amount depending on how hot you want it, right? Yeah. And um, so their ceviche is, ceviche is not hot, but you can add other salsas and also eat it with, chase it with roasted chiles and things like that if you want heat. I mean, it's another thing to remember about Mexican food is people don't realize is that our food is not hot. We cook, everything has chiles just about, but it's all mild preparations. And then we add our own heat on top of the, the mild chiles that are in the preparation. I want chile as an exception. This is just a ceviche, so it would not come uh, very spicy. It would be, uh, you know, open for anybody, any kind of heat level, but we add our own heat after the fact if we want that, if we're heat seekers, you know? Right, right. Okay, let's, next slide, let's see what's up. Okay, Ooh, so, so this, is, this is another, I think because we're talking more detailed, harder dishes at this point. We moved okay. on from the, anybody can do this to not everybody. So this is a, this is a dish by Min Fan, who is one of the um, chefs who is uh, profiled in the Urban Forager. And Min has become pretty well known since the book's publication in 2019. I'm happy to say she is the um, owner of both Porridge and Puffs and Fenikite. In a second, I want to tell you what fenakite means because it's so related to the COVID year. But what you're seeing here is an extraordinarily interesting dish to me and very much a part of what I think Bill and I love about Los Angeles food. Min's background is Vietnamese. She came over here when she was two or three years old for obvious reasons. Um, her father was in the South Vietnamese army and it was time to go. Um, she, it, what you're seeing here is porridge, her version of porridge. And as, as some of you may know, porridge is one of the most international of foods and it's very much a part of Vietnamese cooking. It is not the sweet stuff that we call cream of wheat mm -hmm. in this country. It's usually, in this case particularly, it's a savory dish. It's eaten at all different times of the day, not just breakfast. And this is one of Min's many porridges. Uh, in this case, it's a vegan porridge where the green sauce that you see on there is a number of green um, vegetables and herbs that are blended together to make this exquisite sauce. So it's a very, you know, the porridge is very simple. You, you start with a rice that sloughs off a lot of starch. So it's a short rice. You cook it in cold water till it turns kind of creamy like risotto, um, which is another form of porridge. And then you make a very very strongly flavored sauce. And in Porridge and Puffs, her restaurant, which is still going, um, her layering of flavors was extraordinary and is extraordinary. It was, she would put various forms of stewed meats, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes vegetarian food, various herbal combinations, but layers and layers of flavors that all came together. And in this case, what you're looking at too, are those little, um, those little what look like petals Rose petals are actually pickled pink uh, mini, those little miniature onions, the pearl onions that oh. are marinated in a geranium vinegar sauce oh flavoring. And so she would pick rose geraniums. I mean, this is what, you know, this is so min and, and put it in her vinegar, her rice vinegar and sugar combination. And this perfume would infuse in a few hours, these beautiful pink, pearl onions. The other thing at the top, believe it or not, that looks kind of like a bug, but it's not, <laughs> is, um, is tempura amaranth. So another thing that, that Min does as, as an immigrant to this country and an incredibly creative person is she forages and she uses all parts of plants. One of her favorite parts of plants too is the flowers of fennel. You know, the little flowers, she says it tastes like candy. So this is a dish to me that just typifies the connection to the very early traditional Vietnamese food and then somebody coming to LA and going, but I can do it my own way and mm -hmm. still link to my mother and all these deep traditions of Vietnam. I just, I think it's an absolutely exquisite dish. And I love it. 
but it's not that easy to make. I'm going to tell you this. You have to pay right. attention. Right. But you can, <laughs> if you wanted to, to um, try out and food, you just go to you can go there, but you, I want people to cook. Yeah. So it's in the cookbook, do it. And, and and the nice thing is that the porridge part is the base of whatever you want. I, I throw poached eggs on her on porridge that I make from her and add other flavors. So, anyway. so we, don't, we don't even think about porridge. Yeah. These days, yeah. You know what I really love what you described there is the, is the um, talking about how the, the many different ways that, that uh, she would prepare the porridge over the years, right? Yeah. And that really speaks to the, what I think something that's really important that's lost sometimes when we talk about like people from their own culture, you, you carry your culture your entire life and all those experience, you know, coming from uh, where she came from to here, every single thing is absorbed, but also at home, you know, as a Mexican, we don't, we don't say, okay, today we're making, you know, authentic huevos <laughs> enteros for breakfast. We just make them with whatever is available. And sometimes it gets, it changes. And, and you learn, uh, you've learned through the course of your generations, your grant from your grandmother, your, uh, your parents to you, you, you learn these little things that you can do in your own, you, you can play with your own food in a way that no one that could ever study for 20 years or five years or five months or whatever they, you know, there's just a certain experience that's embedded and that you just can't replicate. And that wonderful sense of play of I can do this with my porridge, I can do this with my porridge, and I can do this, and you can just keep on, you know, developing it in your head because of all those experiences. If I could just add, and I know we have not, it's, it's so much about that. Was she was also um, on her own as a teenager, young teenager, because her parents both worked, you know, as new immigrants. Yeah. Had to work. So she used to say, she reminded me, she said, I used to open that refrigerator and the porridge was sitting on the stove and I'd go, hmm, what's for dinner or what's for lunch? Because she'd come home from school and she literally started her own education, even though she worked in four star restaurants and stodge with some of the great chefs of the world, even in Noma and that kind of, her basic brilliance is exactly what you're saying, Bill, is, is the, is just finding beauty in very, very normal kinds of things and then building on it. Um, her restaurant now, Fenikai, her second restaurant, means formed under pressure. Yeah. And and it, it refers to the making of crystals. Oh. And it's a beautiful restaurant, but I love her, again, her orientation towards metaphor. Let's this, see the next slide. Yeah. Uh, yeah, who's this? Oh, who's that? Uh, Chef Roberto Berriesa. Um, really the, you know, um, one of the first, um, modern Mexican American chefs. And I, I, well, he's, you know, born in Mexico, but he, 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 uh, he opened a, a he opened a restaurant around the same time that basically lots of white cookbook authors, uh, white chefs were beginning to do our cuisine and, and he's overlooked, you know, coming from that same period, you know? But what he was doing in different restaurants in L in LA and and uh, and got you know he got early recognition and his creativity really to me um, is, is so overlooked. But he, you know he was doing he was he he really is in in a vacuum because that the sort of cuisine that he does like you know doing a barbacoa but in a fancy plating and and doing moles with little it's really more like what you would see from uh, Patricia Quintana's restaurant when she had Isote in Mexico City. But those restaurants have all gone away for the new generation of Mexican chefs. There, you know, nobody wants to see those types of food anymore, or they don't, they don't go to those restaurants to support them because everybody's wants the new thing. What's so the restaurant, Bill? What's, uh, uh, Berriesa's restaurant, you know, my gosh, I have not, I, I have been there in such a long time, and I don't even know if he's open right now. I have not uh, heard from him. Um, his, what is his restaurant called? <laughs> you can Google it. I'm going to Google it right this second. Um, and it might even come to me while I'm while I'm thinking about it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, so he got. He was the, really the to me personally, the founder of this sort of uh, upscale Mexican cooking that people say started in other places. Um, so his restaurant 
and his Google is coming up right now. I mean, his uh, Instagram. Oh my gosh. Can't. Thank you for. Oh, Babita. Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm just, I'm like Babita in the San Gabriel Valley is is uh, is an iconic yeah. restaurant. Um, I have again. Yeah. I have not uh, seen him during the pandemic, and and I was actually just thinking today after after this, I need to check in on him. But mm -hmm. yeah, his food, his 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 cuisine is so important, and. Uh, and I hope that someday that he's, you know, he he's part of that story when people talk about it. We need to change. We we need to to fix the story, the way we talk about Mexican cuisine in America and its development. And to me, he's a uh, an essential part of that. Let's see what the next slide is. Papita, thank you. Papita. Oh, there's Min. Oh, so there's need to say not much more except to again notice her raw materials. Wow. Uh, in a garden that was the late great Muir Ranch of Muir High School that she fought to keep by doing fundraisers, typical men. Um, That's behind Muir High School. It's no oh longer my there. Gosh. No longer there. But this is um, she. This is. was her gathering basket for when we were doing our our photo shoot with the wonderful photographer of the Urban Forager and cutting. Our photo shoot with Min Fawn went on for twelve hours because she was such a process girl. She <laughs> we had to go to the ranch. She had to pick, pick her stuff. We had to watch her mise en place, which went on for five hours, and then she cooked her food, and then we had to eat it. So it was wonderful, but it was a 12-hour day. <laughs> anyway, next slide, please. <laughs> I love you, man. Um, this is a, another thing I think that's a fun image to see that every chef that was profiled, we actually kind of created a family of taste influences. And this, this is, is in your cookbook? This is in, yeah, every chef told us kind of, I, I, I did a lot of interviewing, as I'm sure Bill did, and lot, spent a lot of, of really wonderful quality time gaining weight with these guys. And um, what we also did, I really, again, wanted to honor their heritage and where their tastes came from and their ideas. and. So they deconstructed again their food ideas, and in, in this case, it's it's Min again, and hers was the most complex. Mm -hmm. And she goes through um, her a lot has to do with where she sources her food. Uh, Kota Farms rice, for example, a, a very very old Japanese owned Japanese American owned rice farm in Central California. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I just want to say slight coda here uh, for Coda Farms, <laughs> C-O-D-A and K-O-D-A. When they, her, uh, the woman who owns Coda Farms' parents uh, were actually moved into concentration camps during the Second World War. And, and when they left their rice farm, the neighbors threw uh, rusty equipment into the mm -hmm. rice paddies to destroy mm -hmm. it. Um, and that's what they came back to. And they resurrected their farm. And, um, you know, it's an emotional story. And, and here they are now growing some of the most beautiful rice in California that I think Min honors, again, their, the quality of their, and, uh, of their food. And that is true with several of these. The, wow. Almost, uh, she, she describes Farmer Mai, who's a, a wonderful young farmer who's growing grains, who, whose rye I buy when I'm a bread baker here. Uh, she talks about uh, Na Young Ma Proof Bakery, who helped her first develop the recipe for the puffs. So she, you know, as typical a community person, which I think Bill is sort of alluding to too, is you can't separate people from their culture or their communities of relationships. And that's what this was about. Wow. Okay, let's see the next slide. And also, I would love for each of you to address the issue of, is there, or the, the just suggestion that what distinguishes food in Los Angeles is just such a thing as the food of Los Angeles. I don't know if you can combine it with what's, this is gorgeous. It looks delicious. I want to eat it. Maybe you can sort of answer that question as we're looking at this fantastic, <laughs> is this? Yeah, I want, I'm licking the oh. screen here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, um, molcajete, molcajete. Molcajete. Oh, molcajete. Oh my God, that's so much food usually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's like this and that. Go ahead, Bill. Go ahead. You explain. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Say, say your question one more time about the. <laughs> what distinguishes the food in Los Angeles and is there such a thing as food of Los Angeles? Well, yeah. You know, I, I think that one, one thing that happened to me before the, the pan, just right before the pandemic, I was in New York City and, 
and I think it really hit me when I was there because uh, you know there's always obviously all these comparisons with other cities all the time. N New York comes a lot because because they like to always talk about how they have this, that, and the other, and there's these weird things that they're always trying to draw us into, and we're like, okay, come on, you know, let's whatever. And New York's different, LA's different, but I was in Manhattan and uh, staying in this hotel, and I was doing this event, and I went walking around for for probably two hours, and and uh, it was a, a beautiful. I mean, I was like, I actually. I need to not come here when it's cold because it seems like I was always coming to New York when it was snowed in. And so it was nice being out when it was warm weather. Great. But I walked for hours and did not see the community that we think of when we think of New York and this, 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 uh, all these different cultures. I got on a train to 40 for 45 minutes to Jackson Heights. And I finally started to feel like, Oh, now I can walk around and go eat the way I want to eat, try some things I want to try and have that that feeling in Los Angeles. It's five minutes away, mm -hmm. wherever you are. Just about. I mean, you know, Brentwood aside, uh, you know, anywhere you go in Los Angeles, you're five ten minutes away from uh, a cultural enclave, and so and Mexican food is all around, and it's uh, and there's more. It's not just Mexican food. It's Mexican food. Uh, one neighborhood from a specific town, and and we have and I live you know here in Hollywood. I have Thai town. You know, and it's people from different parts of, of Thailand. And I have uh, Guatemalan Central American restaurants in my neighborhood. And I have Oaxacan uh, mini markets and Oaxacan restaurants and, and Armenian. Mm -hmm. So all those things mixed together in, in, a, in a way that you can't find anywhere else where you don't have to get on a train for 45 minutes to see, to see the diversity. The diversity is still around you and it forms everything. And um, there was an article of a, an Italian uh, restaurant. Uh, Sh Steve Sampson was talking about it when his when his restaurant uh, Rosso Blue caught on fire and he reopened. He started to think about like you know I'm doing this like northern Italian cuisine that's sort of subtle, but LA is not about that. It doesn't matter what part of Los Angeles, or what culture you're from. You like spicy food. You like big flavors, and so restaurants and uh, the cuisine, it doesn't matter if you're an LA style restaurant, you, you might have some heat in there. You might have something from the different Asian communities, the different Latino communities that are contributing to that. And those, you know, in, in a way that's not just, well, I'm going to take this and do this because I want to be, you know, add this to my menu, but it really becomes part of what people want to eat. And when the entire culture decides and, and pushes that um, you get things like Kogi Taco, you get things like, you know, Animal, you get things like Porridge and Puffs. And, and people exploring their own cuisines in a way that doesn't happen um, in, uh, in other places on such a mass scale. Everyone's sort of now doing this. You have all these different people. So yeah, Los Angeles is because of the proximity of the cultures and the huge concentration of these groups. Next. Oh, okay. yeah. But tell us what, what is this? What's in this dish, though? This looks delicious. Uh, this is a, a molcajete, and uh, you know, a molcajete is a typical. You find it in, in Mexico, but also in, in a lot of Mexican American uh, restaurants here in Los Angeles. It's a way of doing uh, like a, it's like a surf and turf. You have meats in there sometimes, oh, and, and yeah, and you have grilled vegetables and cheese, and cheese. the actual molcajete is cooked in you know it's it's uh cooked heated so you can't you can't touch it when it comes out and uh really big part of mexican american like friday night party dish you know oh, looks delicious. all right let's see the next slide here so i want to keep going can you move okay. on yeah, and just next slide keep going um okay no that's good i want to just let's go oh, oh let's oh. that's a good one to stop on the map the map? next one Sorry, sorry, next slide. There we are. So that, that really helps answer the question too of what, what Bill was just saying. It, this is a map of, of some of the resources that are in the urban forager where you can buy food, produce, materials. And you can see it's a map of the east side of LA. And look at those numbers. Each one of those numbers represents a small store that is probably most likely owned by a new immigrant to this country who, who created in a sense 
the the sort of central area with concentric circles moving outward of their community. And these circles, as Bill said, began to overlap because there's so many of them that these cultures didn't stay separated. Mm -hmm. They began to overlap and their food began to overlap. So that's one thing. I think that's one LA thing. It's just, it's repeating what Bill said in a visual form. I think the other thing, and I, I said this earlier before we were on, that we didn't have this Michelin star system in LA so that the, the idea of the, the criteria for good food was very different than white napery and how many waiters you had and and whether the music was right and the and the cushions were comfortable and then the food was good too. The the focus has been on the food and the authenticity of the food and really not on sort of the bells, bells and whistles of other stuff. So I felt like I, I really don't want that here and I don't think anybody really cares about that. Well, well yeah, it, it's I, I don't even think it's a matter of I mean, LA doesn't want it. And no, it, it's, an, it's pretty unusual, right? When you think about it, that here you have, if you, when, when you talk about America and you, and you think about the major cities, LA is always on the, any list, you know, it's, it's one of the most important cities and, and it's in the top three cities, you know, if you, uh, or the top, top four, or the top five cities in America. Well, when and, I was, yeah, go ahead. When I, my first book, my first book talk was in San Francisco at Omnivore and Celia Sachs, who's the owner of Omnivore, it's an all cookbook store. Yes. Uh, she introduced me by saying, and so I said, why do you want me here? <laughs> it's my first, because, yeah, it's because, your Bay Area. You know, you're the Bay Area. This is a, this a book is about, the, about the, East LA, side. the East Side. And she said, because Los Angeles is known to have the most interesting, most wonderful food in the entire world. And this is yeah. Yeah. This was the Bay Area talking. So uh, totally, we're interrupting each other now. But I, no, I, no, it's all right. The the well, I th that's what, and, and you know, I, I'm thinking about the same when you brought it up that we we're going to talk about Michelin, and that really is the 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 litmus test of of what LA is about because Michelin can work it works everywhere else because you can uh, boil down a, a visit to Chicago or a visit to New York in, uh, with a Michelin guide. You can boil San Fran you can certainly boil San Francisco down to that. You right. cannot even touch Los Angeles with that with that guide. It doesn't mm -hmm. work. It doesn't fit. They're they're they tried, it failed because they couldn't do better than they couldn't do better than Yelp. Even Yelp <laughs> yeah. the Michelin guide when the first Michelin guide came in, and everybody was just like and, and then everybody just piles in like, no, that you know, this this it should be this, it should be that. LA Times even has a hard time with their 101 list. I they always so. mess it up. It doesn't matter how yeah. good their critic is and how how much research they do. They always get push and pull from these different uh, groups because they 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 lack it lacks a, an understanding of the way people are really eating, no matter how hard they try to do it. And so LA is so diverse, and w the way we eat cannot be put in a Michelin guide. Um, and uh, you know, Michelin came here again, and we I guess we we, we paid them to do it, right? California, the state of California. But it care. wasn't for us. It was like for San Francisco and all these other places. We don't, no. we don't care. We don't care. Okay. I, uh, let's yeah. see. Is there another slide? Oh, by the way, I want to just oh, mention. Can we go back to the slide and yeah. explain what it is? And, yeah, I, I do want to say urban forager. No, that does not mean looking for the greatest sofa that's thrown out on the curb. The urban forager right. means because these days it's amazing what people are putting on yeah. the curb. It's like, wow, I could have furnished yeah. my first apartment with this stuff. But anyway, forager means get out of the grocery stores, get out of the bonds, get out of the rails. Forage going to the wonderful little shops, the, and here in Altadena, there's full yeah. of them. Oh my God, and yeah. and you, you go into these little shops and they often don't look like anything special on the outside. You go no. in and it's wonderful. And it doesn't take you that much longer because they're small and you don't have to like go walk a half a mile to get you know yeah. your milk. So check out these small places in yes. your neighborhood they're everywhere and, and yeah go, don't, go don't a whole two weeks with no major stores just try it. i it's actually wonderful. go through months without a major store major and, and i i want to make a point related to babita babita is this little house that you would drive yeah. right really and, 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 no it's a little it not, does not call out to you for sure in the middle of kind of nowhere as far as the west siders would be concerned and um and this is true of many of these little stores on the outside. Many, many people might be fearful about entering because it doesn't look beautiful on the outside. All of the resources and money are embedded in the food. And once you walk mm -hmm. through the door, like one of my favorite stores is La Mayordomia. It yeah. is 
one of, isn't it gorgeous? Wahawken Market. Wahawken Market. It's in Arlington Heights. You walk through the door, which looks like walking through, you know, kind of this dark tunnel. <laughs> and suddenly there are baskets, beautiful baskets filled with some of the most exquisite produce, the, some of the best masa, beautiful pastries. And the owner is this lovely guy. And he, he, he came over to me and goes, do you know these scallions or whatever, you know, whatever the word? They weren't really scallions, Bill, you know, they were the thicker version of green yeah. onion. He said, these are from my parents' garden. I brought them up. Oh and God. I'm just kind of like, so there is fun. no, it, 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 it's actually a fulfilling experience to do this. It's, it's like you're getting to know yourself through these experiences. So okay, anyway, now, do now be brave. We can go to the next slide and see what it's and Val, that, And that's our connection right here because Zeferino's in my book, the one who she's talking I about. Know, <laughs> I know, I know. Isn't he wonderful? Yeah. He's so great. Who's this? Who's this, Bill? This is this is Chef Rocio Camacho, mm -hmm. and she's got her restaurant in um, Bell Gardens, uh, Rocio's Mex Mexican Kitchen. And mm -hmm. what's really amazing about about her is, you know, this again, this is very Los Angeles. She's a Oaxacan traditional Oaxacan cook who was trained as a chef in Oaxaca, and has put her mark on so many restaurants in Los Angeles. And she also has her own place now that you have to go to. It has a little bit of her Oaxacan heritage, but it also has foods for the community. The most amazing, you know, she's a, a queen of, or goddess of moles. And I love that she's not afraid to to constant, constantly refer to herself as a goddess of moles. <laughs> and, goddess and goddess. <laughs> yeah. And so, I, I'm, I, you know, you are, she, she truly is. And you know, I, the one thing, the one joy, joy of my last four years with my book is we did a couple of events with her and, and just watching her, you know, the way she can blend traditional cooking with modern kitchen uh, uh, techniques and experiences and tell her story is, is amazing. But yeah, go to, and, and right now, you know, obviously I think we are saying also, you need to go out and support these. If you have not been going out, go support restaurants. Uh, don't order. I mean, if you have, if you need to order, order, I guess. But, you know, go to the restaurants, support them, tell your friends to go. And we're, we're, we're now in the business of saving restaurants. That's right. Yes. And uh, restaurants, please. Time to go out. Yeah. Have fun in a good situation. And buy you drinks, which is how they make their money. <laughs> next slide, yeah. please. Yes. Next slide. Let's see what's next. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, goody, goody. This is a good one. So here's Mario Rodriguez, and Mario Rodriguez, one of the things I want to make clear is that these are not all professional chefs in the urban forest. No, no, no. Three of the, of the five plus one in Mexico are, are home cooks. And Mario is a social work administrator by day and an incredible cook by any other moment in his life. And here he is, um, his photo is he's holding his mother's mocajete. And his recipes are based on um, deep experience that is so diverse. He's big on family. So Min was big on family plus where she gets her stuff from, her farmers and so on. And he, he's got Tia Victoria and Mavi and out, you know, his dad, Chewy, and his, his <laughs> uncle Tonio and his Tia Rita. But he also went to the, um, to a professional cooking school as did I and he got he got his professional cooking uh, experience in his under his belt and he's very good friends with David Feo who's a four-star chef traditional French chef and they like to cook together and he's worked sometimes with David and at Christmas time pre-COVID I think they're going to start this up again they used to make tamal tamales with confit and and as well as traditional filling. So Mario is sort of this omnivore, brilliant, unafraid chef, cook. I guess he's a cook because he's not a professional, who, who just lives and breathes the kind of aesthetics of food. And he's so much fun to cook with. So there he is. He was the first person I actually um, interviewed. And he was my first person that sort of guided me through the food of, of, East, of East Side. 
And I just want to read one thing that I wrote about him. I said, some of us are born with a golden spoon in our mouths. Most everything we taste is a potential treasure to be collected into our food palette memory. And that is Mario Rodriguez. He is just inspiring for anybody who wants to start cooking. Let's see what yeah. it is, if there is one. And we have about five minutes left. We and, it, and it's very Chicano to put anything inside of a tamal. Anything, I know. <laughs> And yeah, you know, I have to say though, I, I tasted the unconfit tamale and I just I'm I'm more of the traditionalist. I like I like the pork it, the confit was very nice. I like I like shrimp tamales. Shrimp tamales are amazing. Corn tamales. Yeah. <laughs> um I, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> I like the chilies. I like the I like the chilies too. Okay. Would you like to continue, Bill? <laughs> yes. Susanna McManus, uh Silito Lindo was just in the news. Um, you know, when, when, when we're seeing these slides, are like, we're just, I, I know you thought about, about that when you saw Porridge and Puffs, we're mm -hmm. thinking about all the struggles that everybody's going through. And, uh, I, I mean, we are ourselves, but it, it certainly, uh, hurts when, when it's these restaurants that you love and Stilito Lindo, um, for me, the, they, they are where Mexican food, Mexican American food begins in Los Angeles in a lot of ways. And as far as spreading it to the masses, and and really this 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 struggle that Mexican cuisine has had to break out of being put in ghettos and mm -hmm. um, and kept you know kept these vendors kept from being successful in other neighborhoods, all the redlining that went on, and but that taquito that they made and that avocado salsa has really helped spread the gospel of Mexican American cuisine across the United States. And I love the fact that when I asked her about the recipe, she just, I said, I go, I know you're not going to give me the avocado salsa. And she, and I go, and she goes, why not? I go, um, uh, <laughs> wait, 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 we're going to do the, we're doing the avocado salsa. She goes, yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> is, that how, is that how recipes get stolen? And that? Well, that I think, I think there's, there's a couple of things here to, to, to think about when you, when you have such an iconic, sauce you know is we're never you can do it at home as, as many ways you're not going to do it exactly like them mm -hmm. uh you're not using the exact same devices they're using and that whatever you know they have this really fun method if you ever watch them cook the taquitos they have one like like they have a pan that just has oil in it one that's full of taquitos and they keep switching them and moving them back and forth so they got this the mm -hmm. system that all those things add to the to their are part of their recipe and you know, there's there is this little thing that sometimes people uh, leave leave a little something out, and or add something in to change it just enough. Um, so I I don't know that we have 100%. You never know, or we may have it, but you're not going to stop going to Silito Lindo because you can make the salsa at mm -hmm. home. You're just you're that's that's only part of the experience. Um, I think it's fun. It's fun to cook and learn, but. We don't want to use that to profit or to or to ignore where that where that food came from. So for me, if I make a ceviche uh, from Connie Seafood, and the the molcajete was from Casa Vega, and if I if I do one of those things, I'm never going to stop. That might be for a party or a special thing, but I'm never going to stop going to those restaurants and supporting okay. them. Now we have about one minute left. I don't know if there's any more slides, um, but I just would like to ask you both. You know, what's the final message you'd like to leave with people? In this post-COVID world, we're emerging now. We can start exploring again. Anything in particular you'd like to say to folks out there as they approach eating together in restaurants again? I think I'll I'll, I'll just speak. There's there's uh, Sumi Chang and, um, and Masako Yatavi Thompson who said to mention them. And, and Rumi Mahmood was the one with the knife and the wine. Uh, I I think. I, I just want to echo what Bill said. It's really time for us to, as we move into the world to really double our, our support of these, these people in the small stores and restaurants. They have been um, some of the most heroic individuals other than our first, our first responders, I think, during this period. Many of them have become um, kind of the clean, well-lighted place, communities that we could connect with even in this deep period of isolation. So now to you, Bill, what would you say? Well, Bill, you only yeah. have 10 seconds. What's Literally. that? They're going to cut us off in 10, 10 seconds. seconds. So, you know what? I'm just going to say thank you because we've got to go. Yes. <laughs>
But check out the cookbooks. And thank you so much, LitFest Pasadena. This has been a fantastic experience. And I just hope you all go out and enjoy LA food. Bye.